Welcome back to the Magic Sponge Podcast, a miracle cure for all your rugby league injury issues. I'm Brian Sini. I'm the guy behind NRL Physio and everything you see on social media. My co-host, James. You're in again, mate. We are running low on technology tonight. I am up in Gympie visiting the folks. I'm sitting in Dad's uh, dingy office, the farm office at the moment, just trying to get all the tech to work. I'm sure the listeners will have missed hearing Gus Gould say, you know, it was just an accident. Uh, He can't disappear. Not having that in their ear holes this week will be tough, but the good news is you're going to listen to myself and yourself talk about how teams are going to win the comp because they both had big wins this week. Absolutely. Dulcet tones, just of you and I, Brian. And good to hear that you're up the highway there in the 4570 in God's country, as the Gippieites like to refer to it as. Better weeks for this for us this week, though. Broncos on the board. Dolphins had a huge win today with Hammer. So Tabo Ifido looking to absolute business. Pretty good signs for the Dolphins, mate. Mate, they were very, very good today. It was good to sit here with the old man today. Obviously, he, you know, was in Redcliffe long before me, so it was good to watch it with him. My daughter was here as well, and and Hammer's her favourite player, so she's getting around that, which is good. So yeah, no, it was good, good to see. And and the twenty twenty four, it's the Dolphins year. I've always said it. Uh, didn't even waver last week when they got pumped. But anyway, uh, we move on now, guys. Uh, worth mentioning uh, tonight. Yep pod as usual uh next week no pod i will be away um on holidays and just can't uh, look i just spoke about how low tech we are on this show i simply yeah struggle to figure out how we can do the pod i could probably do an audio one maybe but it's just going to be yeah a bit too hard so we'll skip the show next week sorry to anybody who is Uh, desperate for the beautiful magic sponge every week. But, uh, yeah, we'll be back as usual the week after. So, as always, guys, we're on YouTube now, so please jump on over there. I think it's youtube.com slash NRL Physio or just search NRL Physio on YouTube and you'll see it there. Uh, Please subscribe. The subscribers are growing every week. We're getting more viewers on YouTube than I ever thought we'd get. I think James and I spoke about it last week. Not sure uh, how many people would want to sit and look at us talking uh, about injuries and footy and stuff like that, but there is, and that's great. So, um, yeah, and good interacting with people over there because you can kind of see the comments and all that kind of stuff, which you you can't, you know, you don't do when we're on Spotify or Apple or whatever it is. So it's good to have that interaction as well, which is great. Uh, You know why you're here. One-stop shop for all things injury analysis in the NRL. We cover the in-game injuries. We relate it back to super coach fantasy all of those wonderful, I think, draft stars, you know, anything that you need fantasy for, super coach for, we're going to cover it. If you get value out of this content, patreon.com slash NRL Physio, head on over there, all the good stuff. Let's get into it, James. No intro music. So once again, you don't hear, get to hear about Braith playing doctor tonight, unfortunately, but James, let's get straight into the injuries. Yeah, sadly, no Braith and no Brandy, Brian. They're, that's probably my favourite clip up of the whole podcast, to be fair. So I, I might just repeat some old episodes and get that fixed. We're going to start with the HIAs and concussions out of this week, Brian. So we're going to rip through these names first because I think we normally do them in the game-by-game analysis, but we thought actually it might be easier just to cover HIAs and who will be likely missing or entering the protocol with the 11-day stand-down period. So the first four names, Paisa Farmasuli from the Bulldogs, Bailey Simonson there from the Eels, Seb Chris from the Raiders, Cody Nicarima from the Dolphins, they're entering that protocol period now. The last one on this list here is Luke Keary, who had a HIA today with results unknown. Anyone you want to talk to in more detail there, Brian, straight out of the gate? Yeah, I think uh, Bailey Simonson's probably the one of the guys who have definitely failed, who is worth mentioning, just because it's his fifth concussion in about the last, I think I went back to 2021, so fifth concussion in about the last three and a half years. So once again, not all about number of concussions, and we'll talk about that in regards to Luke Curie in a second. But yeah, just, just I, I guess, really stacking up in a quick period of time. So something to keep an eye on with him, just potential, probably more potential than the other guys to have that extended recovery. Uh, yeah, the other guys on that list probably know who have failed. Uh, nothing sticks out to me there. The Luke Keary one, I think that's obviously going to be the big talking point uh, for, for us, for, for everyone this week. It happened right near the end of the game, so we're all not sure 
whether he passed, whether he failed, he lay motionless on the ground for a few seconds and then rolled over on his back. I went back and tried to like time the different, um, you know, I, I get, because there's certain timings for is it a category one or a category two, but Fox or nine, whoever's covering the game kept flashing away from it. And I'm like, this is a huge moment. You know, Luke Carey's lying motionless on the ground. And I know you don't, you know, if the player's injured, you don't want to, focus on that but yeah i was just surprised they they kept sort of floating away um but yes so it was unclear as to how long he kind of spent down on the ground he was definitely motionless for for a few seconds there whether that's enough to be a category one i'll I'll leave that in the hands of the doctors i think the thing to focus on here obviously with kiri is that he has he has six six diagnosed concussions that we know of. There may be more, but those six were the six in game. Uh, he potentially has had more, you know, in in training or at other times as well. But the big thing with Kiri, and we speak about it when when we talk about James Tedesco. James Tedesco's had nine concussions now, but still, I think his last three concussions, he's all come back you know, in that minimum two-week period. So it's not all about the number of concussions. Why Kiri has that increased concern is because he has had multiple concussions now that have resulted in lengthy recovery periods, like six-plus weeks on the sideline because of ongoing symptoms, headaches, nausea, uh, I think even the last one, he had delayed symptoms as well. So that's probably the concern here, I think, is even with like uh, Trent Robertson post-game saying, yeah, look, he, he seemed with it. He, he seemed pretty good. We're, we're pretty happy with that. That's fantastic. But knowing Kiri's history there, it doesn't really count for a whole lot considering he's had, yeah, he's had multiple concussions with those delayed symptoms as well. So, uh, look, I'm not saying him being good right now is a is a bad thing. Like it's obviously, if he if he wasn't good right now, that would definitely be worse than the position we're in at the moment. But yeah, it's just the the, the danger of the unknown here is is the I guess the scariest thing is that each concussion is unique, each concussion is different. But the more history you have with those complex concussion recoveries with ongoing symptoms lengthy recovery periods on the sideline. It just leaves you at an increased risk moving forward of that happening again. So, yeah, obviously thoughts with Kiri. Hopefully he, you know, doesn't have a concussion past the HIA um, and and it doesn't have to worry about that. But, yeah, it's, it's obviously a concern at this point in time. Mate, I wanted to throw back to you because, I mean, I'm getting peppered by it uh, on all of my socials at the moment. Did you see the Jeremy Marshall King Falcon? And also, how did he pass that HIA, mate? Firstly, on the Falcon, it was so clean. It was just so pure. I think there's just something really nice about a really clean Falcon. I think that was the um, the origin of how it came to be was when Mario was walking off the field, head down, and the balls passed to him without his knowledge, and it just clicks him so cleanly. And there's something just so beautiful about that in my eyes. It just is so funny to me when you see just the cleanness of the Falcon. And I guess just the thing that stood out was just the deflection that the ball took. Like how far the ball ricocheted off his face was quite amazing. Like It was probably 40, 30, 40 metres at least before the winger picked it up and scooped the ball up. How did he pass? That's a pretty good question. From my viewpoint, it looked like on the way to the ground, he sort of demonstrated some Cat 1 signs to me. So I'm a little bit surprised that he played on. But what was your take on things, Brian? It was very clean. Obviously, I've spoken a lot about the aesthetics of it. What do you reckon about the nitty-gritty? Yeah, mate. Like I, um, to let people in behind the... uh... Behind the curtain, I, you know, I'm obviously at the farm at the moment and sort of running around and, and doing different things and saw it and was like, first reaction, he's definitely ruled out. Uh, in halftime, had a, a, you know, a few minutes and knew that I wouldn't have a lot of time in the second half with what was going on here at the farm. So draft up a tweet. I've got it sitting on my phone at the moment being like, Jeremy Marshall King failed his HIA, got the video of it. Got the video of him doing a little bit of a wobble. Uh, and, yeah, uh, I had it ready to go. And I was like, I'll press send on that as soon as it's announced that he's not coming back. And then he came back. So, yeah, like I know there's heaps of people asking at the moment, how did he pass? And my answer to you is I'm not 
really sure that like the the pure answer with this every time is that the and and I guess the thing now with it is there's an independent doctor to consider as well. So it's not just the club doctor, you know, you, like you can't you can't anymore accuse the the club doctors of fudging the results because there's a there's an independent doctor there too reviewing all of this. So the independent doctor has reviewed that footage of what we thought was a wobble or a stumble and said, no, nah, it's all good. The club doctor has said, no, nah, it's all good. Then he's passed his HI in the sheds. That's the that's the real world answer. Uh, yeah, what they were saying that we did we saw or didn't see, I, I'm not sure. It was just a yeah, just a, such a strange one. And I don't think I don't think we're ever going to win trying to come up with these things because you never you're never going to get a doctor in front of like the media scrum after the game or anything like that. So it's just going to be unfortunately I'm not sure they really to be fair. No, and I, I just think it's it, it's just going to be one where yeah we're just going to have to accept moving forward and and hopefully I think in the time coming it's going to move to like those objective tests which we've talked about like blood tests saliva tests these kind of things where it, it isn't left to any doubt it is then like well you either pass your test or you don't there's some eye tracking tests as well so yeah I think we're moving towards that and hopefully that will come in soon but for the moment there's just going to be subjectivity. Yeah, very good point. We're going to wrap up the games now and the injuries from the games, Brian. First one was Broncos v Rabbitohs. So some big names here for the Broncos. Adam Reynolds looks like he's aggravated his MCL injury. Payne Haas has been reported with a knee concern, which is bad news for fantasy rosterers, of which I am one as of last week. So that's looking great for my hopes to start off the year. Reese Walsh, leg cork, Ezra Man with a shoulder concern. And then for the Bunnies, um, good bit of information you put up about Jai Arrow and a possible rotator cuff tear that is looking fairly unknown about how that's going to play out, whether we're going to go down the full rehab track, how that's going to go, or whether he's going to need surgery. A uh, lot of question marks about Jai Arrow, hey? Yeah, I think we'll start there because the Broncos are probably the, <coughs> pardon me, the most injured uh, team this week. Jai Arrow with the rotator cuff tear, it's been announced that he is going to rehab it for the moment. So about four, usually it's four to six weeks of rehab, so strengthening, getting the range of movement back, getting the stability back in around that shoulder. So he's going to spend four weeks doing that. I, I guess the important point to say here is that it's just not a, oh, yep, sweet, he's going to do that and then he's good for the rest of the season. That rotator cuff tear isn't going anywhere. It's going to need to be repaired at some point. It could be that he doesn't even make it back. That is a true potential because they look at the scans, they look at his function so far, and they might be like, look, things are looking pretty good at the moment. We're happy to rehab you. They could get him 75% of the way through his rehab, and then his shoulder function could pretty much flatline. So he, he can't get his shoulder right above his head. He can't get strength, you know, in certain ranges. And they go, well, we, we've tried. We've got him to 75%. And now we can't get him any further. So it, it's surgery. He could also return, uh, you know, be fine for three weeks, for 10 weeks, for 15 weeks, and then hurt it again and then need surgery as well. So it's just a super, and I use this word all the time. I think it's my new um, catchphrase, but volatile. Like it, it could be... He could be fine for the rest of the season and no worries. I think they're even if he's fine for the rest of the season, so he plays for the rest of the season, there's just that worry that he needs limited minutes, workload. So if you're a, if you're a super coach or fantasy holder, even in draft, unless you yeah, unless there's nothing on your waivers, I I just think he's not worth holding. But yeah, I just wanted to emphasize that this is a it's a real up and down situation. It could go so many different ways. Adam Reynolds with the MCL sprain aggravation, he's been ruled out of next week. I Like, ideally, if I was a Broncos fan, which I know you are one, and I'll throw to you in a second, I'd want him to have two weeks off at least and return in that third week just because it's a long season. You don't need Adam Reynolds playing on an MCL that saw – like, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a little bit of meniscus issue as well. His knee looked pretty loose in those tests. We were messaging each other at the time. So I'm just like, let that thing settle down. Come back when you are fully, completely ready. I just, I think the Bronx is going to win enough games to make top eight, you know, potentially top four, even if he sits out two or three games. 
Uh, if he can't, like, if he returns after only missing a week, there's just that look, MCL sprains aren't super high re injury rate because they are contact injuries by nature that you have to get hit right in the right spot in the right direction or the wrong spot in the wrong direction. And that's how you re injure it again. So you'd hope that he can avoid that, but there's no guarantees. Uh, Payne has with his knee. Apparently he's had scans and it's shown up not much, but it's still pretty sore. So probably some swelling. Uh, lack of range. He's another guy. You probably want him, to, well, not if you're a super coach owner, but as a Broncos, you know, the Broncos will want him to play against Penrith, but with the long season in mind, if he's still got inflammation by, like, I think we'll know by Monday. I think you'll know you're probably going to be listening to this um, on Monday or Tuesday. I think you'll probably know uh, over the next couple of days as to whether he's going to play. Reese Walsh with a leg cork, nothing to worry about. Ezra Mam, he did seem to be carrying a shoulder issue, so there was no news of that from Kevy today in his press conference. So we'll wait and see what comes of that. He obviously dealt with the shoulder issue through last year. I don't know whether it's the same shoulder or not. Uh, yeah, that's something to keep an eye on too. But no reports that that's anything significant to worry about this time, which is good news. But, yeah, where are you at as a Broncos man uh, with Reynolds and Haas? What's your feelings on, A, their recovery time, but, B, how like you know how do you balance your super coach and fandom and go how long would you like them to have off? Yeah, look, Reynolds looks like the longer of the two, doesn't it? I think Payne Haas is – Shown in the past that he'll play through a lot of things without a real big performance dip. So I probably wouldn't be worried too much about pain. If he does miss, he might only be a week. And I think he will play significant minutes moving forward from there, all being well. Adam Reynolds might be, you know, I'd probably lean a bit longer than a week for him. Like he said, with the tests on the field, they did, they did look like there was a little bit of laxity. So you could almost, you know, see like the um, lip reading, I suppose you could say, looks like, oh, it feels loose. Like it just sounded like they were a little bit concerned about the stability of that knee. I wouldn't be surprised if it's even more than a fortnight there, maybe ranging in the three to four week range with Adam Reynolds, a little bit older, does have um, some accumulated soft tissue things over the years as well. Um, it was his left knee, wasn't it? It's probably not as big an implication for his goal kicking or his general play kicking, but yeah, it's, it's probably one I'd expect a little bit longer on the sideline than someone like Payne Haas, I think, in that scenario. Ezra, ma'am, I, the only thing I saw from that game, Brian, was um, Ezra tried to put a shot on maybe like a burner type thing or chest type thing. He's sort of holding chest, chest front of shoulder, just trying to just trying to whack someone coming down the line. So again, I don't know if that's an ex exacerbation of a previous thing or if there's anything to worry about there. If Kevin didn't mention it, probably not a huge amount to worry about. Kevin's normally a pretty open book with that sort of stuff. He normally sort of gives a fair bit away, old Kay Walters. So probably not much to worry about there. We'll move on to the Sharks Bulldogs there, Brian. So only one, this was pre-game from last week, was Josh Yaddo Carr. He got named on the extended bench for this game with that. It was reported it was a complex AC joint injury. It wasn't really any chance of shaping up this week. I think he wanted the staff to consider him, but I don't know how much longer we're expecting on the sideline. I think tentatively we said, you know, probably in the range of sort of like between sort of three to six weeks initially. Has your sentiments changed on that time frame? Yeah, I think, uh, like, I think he'll, he, he's pushing to be back next week. I'd say it sounds like it's a it's a grade three that's settled pretty quickly. Um, you know, this complex AC joint injury, like usually if it's a complete tear, that can settle relatively quickly because the ligament's torn. It's, you know, not there anymore. And we spoke about you can come back as soon as two weeks. So I expect him to play next week because he was pretty close this week by all accounts. But, uh, yeah, it'll just be that increased risk of aggravation, which we spoke about. So, yeah, it's, it's once again, it's not something I'm super excited about. If I was a Doggies fan, I'd almost want him to sit out an extra week as, as much as they need all the help they can get at, uh, at this point in time. But, uh, yeah, you just it's going to be something to watch for, for an aggravation uh, in-game as, as the weeks come. Yeah, the outside backs is where they've got actually a bit of depth anyway. So I don't really see the rush to get out of car back on the field from that point of view because they're reasonably well stocked there. They're, they're, they're sort of slim in other positions, but outside backs is not a one I look at and just think, oh, they're in a dire spot there. But anyway, I guess we'll see what happens with Josh Adokar. Panthers Eels was the next match, Brian. So we've got James Fisher-Harris with a shoulder concern out of this one. He only played about 20-ish minutes and didn't come back on the field in this game. So that was interesting in a very tight one. And then also Kelmer Sulungi, who came out like a missile and uh, whacked Liam Martin. He dislocated his shoulder in that attempt to 
tackle. What would you have you heard much news on Fisher Harris to start with? Because he's probably the one that might not be as highly rostered for fantasy, but he's probably one that's quite important to the Penrith engine room there. Yeah, he, uh, the news came out this afternoon. It's looking like scans cleared him of anything too significant, which is obviously fantastic news because Penrith are pretty worried about it. And, and by all accounts, even though he's been cleared of most structural damage, he's still in quite a bit of pain. So they, they've kind of indicated he's very unlikely to play in round three, but it potentially won't be that lengthy recovery that Penrith were first fearing. So what is it? With that kind of thing, you know, is it a significant, like, oh, I just think I would be surprised if it's come back as a clean scan. You know what I mean? Like they say there's no s- structural damage. I'm like, I reckon there's probably something, but it's it's nothing enough for them to report or to, you know, say it's going to need surgery. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there is a, you know, a small tear or a strain or a sprain of, of something in there and some significant inflammation, uh, but just nothing enough for them to and and Penrith can be a bit shady when it comes to that kind of stuff to to good reason uh you know for competitive advantage at times so yeah I I think I'd be expecting him back in two to four weeks it sounds like at this point in time so won't play week week three could be back as soon as week four but once again a bit like the Jai Arrow one obviously we don't have a confirmed uh rotator cuff tear here but just an increased risk of aggravation moving forward and for a middle forward like james fisher harris that is a bit of a concern we have seen him do it in the past and play through it though so yeah got to have some balance there come to like mate this from a physio perspective and for what i do you know week to week and i'm sure you watch my videos and sort of have a look at it as well like weird mechanism for a shoulder dislocation to be fair we haven't really got a close up on what happened to the shoulder as he made that hit but it looked like it was a pretty standard you know he's just hit on that shoulder (sighs) usually you're landing on an outstretched arm you're getting you know your arm pulled back that way certainly not like a hit directly to almost like the chest shoulder region which is what it seemed to be so yeah like for nerd purposes i think that was really unique whether it's an inferior dislocation where it pushed it down as it hit which is less common but can happen uh i'd, I'd just love to have access to the footage uh to, to know more there but for uh you know real life purposes for people who are listening he's going to have scans to see the damage pretty much it's three to six weeks of rehab, a bit like Arrow, three to six weeks of rehab, which doesn't guarantee that he can avoid surgery altogether or it's immediate surgery and three-plus months recovery. So dime or dust for him, unfortunately. Complicating the Fisher-Harris thing, Brian, I just had a quick squeeze. Penrith had the week six buy. So it would be, so they'd have to rest in week four, sorry, week three, four, five, and then Mm. back week seven, which would be on the higher end of things. But might be one just with the time frame there, depending on how things settle for James Fisher Harris to keep an eye on there. Raiders v Tigers was the next one. Raiders two and zero to start the season. Goodbye the young Raiders upstarts there. Stafford Toa had a e version ankle injury. Looks like a high ankle sprain. Brian probably high grade, I'd imagine. Yeah, Benji said post match looking like a syndesmosis injury. So a bit like Hylam Lukey, uh, who we'll talk about in a second. Yeah, like when you have a mechanism like that and the player doesn't come back on. Uh, and, you know, has to go off and doesn't come back on, I'm worried for, like, it's going to be at least four weeks and then, like, with rehab and then potentially six to eight weeks and needing surgery. So, yeah, lengthy uh, stint ahead for him. So I think that, like, the super coach implications I'll throw to you, and I think is he someone you bought this week, the uh, Young Tigers centre? Yeah, far to up, I did buy because I was mindful that Justin Olam is pegged for round four, and I think the only other one was Brent Naden was around four as well. So I thought maybe if far to up, I can stay in the squad there, might be able to get one or two price rises out of him. So I had to bring him in as part of my sort of upgrade and downgrade options just to save some cash because he's basement level price. So it does open up another position um, in the back line there at the Tigers. I think Justin Olam's got one, obviously, but... Hopefully, Father Ape can be the other one there, um, pending Brent and Aiden, I guess is the only other one waiting in the wings. Cowboys v Knights, Hyam Lukey, again, another high-grade syndesmosis injury here, and Jack Hetherington with an ankle sprain. Probably Jack Hetherington, Brian, I, I didn't see this injury. Do you know what he would be expecting in terms of severity there? 
No, I didn't. I couldn't find it either in my limited. I had a bit of limited time this weekend, so he probably wasn't high on my priority list. No, um, yeah, no offense to Jack Hetherington there, but it sounded like he rolled, like it was described as he rolled it. So I would be thinking potentially lateral ankle sprain. So potentially not much to worry about. Yeah, Holland Lukey, just horrific. Like the poor bloke, and and this is a perfect example of a guy who will be called injury prone, right? Like he has had ACL hamstring significant injuries over the last couple of seasons. This, like I go to my page and look at the mechanism. It's just pure bad luck. Like what do you, like what? No one is avoiding that. And that happens. It's like paps from last year. Like if you have Nelson, a sofa, Solomon, or fall on your ankle like that, what are you going to do? If you have, I can't remember who it was. I think it might've even been Griffin name, but it was like, you know, if you have a player like that fall on your ankle, what are you going to do? Like he's not, that that's not his body being weak or, you know, prone to injury. It's just footy. That's what happens, those contact injuries. So six to eight weeks. The good news here is that the return time is pretty consistent, six to eight weeks, like 95% of NRL players come back in that time. Not only do they come back in that time, but they return performance-wise really well too. So if you're a Holland Lukey owner in draft, you can confidently have him on your bench thinking that he will come back uh, at a good performance level. Uh, and, but I think in classic, you sell him anyway. I think Finny Fuiaki is a really interesting prospect. He's someone who oh, we spoke about super coach leading into this as to what we're going to do, but off air, we were talking about our plans. He's someone who I would heavily consider depending on the Cowboys bench and what's named there. So yeah, he'll get at least six to eight weeks on that edge. Yeah, good good shout on that one, Brian. I think no other things to add there from the Cows. Nine, Storm Warriors, there's nothing to talk about there. Manly v Roosters, a couple of big names out of this one. One that we pumped up all off-season. He was my heart pick. When he got named this week, I was overjoyed. But Tommy Talao sustained an ankle injury in this one. We'll talk about that in a bit more depth. The other two players, Molly Olkwatu with a leg cork and Tommy Turbo with a leg concern as well. Um, what do you want to start here, Brian? Because three big names for the Manly team, even though they've got a good win over the Roosters. So Manly are 2-0. and They're flying to start the season. Where do you want to start? What do you want to do? Mate, we've got to start with the biggest name on the list, Tommy Talao, right? Talao. Like, yeah, yeah. We're, like, if we're, if we're going to go from most important to least important, Tommy Talao's first. Mate, I just want to, you know, call you out. Obviously, we talk about the uh, Bill Knowles curse on occasion on this show as the tinfoil hatter of this podcast. We spoke highly about Tommy Talao in the preseason. I want to raise you that there is a tinfoil hat curse, mate. And Tommy Talao, he got out there. He was looking good. He got HIA'd. And we, I was surprised that he, he came back on after the HIA because he looked pretty dusty. And he's come back on and potentially, I mean, to talk seriously for a second, I think this might be a it, – it's a potential for an injury that NRL fans may not be aware of uh, and, and we haven't seen pretty much in the time that I've tracked injuries and it's called a subtalar dislocation. So looking at the footage, I thought it was it was possible with how far his ankle went. So subtalar – the best way to describe it to listeners is the bone below your ankle. So your heel kind of slides out on the in, well, it slides inwards. So as you roll that, that heel bone kind of slides out, there is a joint there. Uh, the good news is, is that if it is that, and, and Seabold even said post-match, he said potentially they are thinking it could be a dislocation. So it's either, you know, it's either a bad sprain or a dislocation, potentially a fracture, he said as well. In terms of dislocations, that's about the most minor one you can have in an ankle. The one that Paps had was the actual true ankle joint up a bit higher, but for Tommy, it will be down lower if it is that. Uh, so you, you can see players come back in as quick as a month, um, which sounds crazy to hear about an ankle dislocation. But yeah, because it's only that lower heel bone, it is possible. But yeah, certainly um, scans will be pretty interesting here because it could be one month, it could be two months, it could be longer if he's got a fracture. So hopefully it's just a really severe, like nasty 
ankle lateral ankle sprain and he can be back in two to three weeks particularly for your super coach side but mate i mean you've got a lot to answer for here I, like i'll quickly say Alokuatu and Tabojevic are apparently nothing to worry about lower leg cork for Alokuatu and turbo they said nothing to worry about but James, you've got a lot to answer for here, mate. You've put the the curse on Tommy Talao, and uh, yeah, who knows when he's going to be back for you now. Well, I'd like to apologise on behalf of the Magic Sponge to Tommy personally here, Brian, and also his lovely partner Jess. Things look like they're going well there, so that's a real, it's a real stitch up for Jess if she's having to do some some care needs there. If Tommy's crutch bound and his moon boot bound for a period of time, so. Yeah, really, really sad to see because I guess he was one we talked about in the off season. A lot of very deep conspiracies about why he would be a good ad. I had a fairly um, decent wager on him scoring two plus today, so you can imagine my roller coaster watching this game as well. Because obviously he was gonna, he looked like he was gonna be HI eight and off, and I was like pretty devo. But then he came back on. I was like, all right, I'm back on here. We're still alive. We're still good. Scored straight after half time. Still looking good. I was like, all right. This has been one of the greatest calls of all time, um, only to sustain an injury later in the game. It was, a, it was a very up and down day. I still think the eye test, Brian, was so much better than I thought it would be. And, and I know this is me slurping up my own, like smell my own farts, and I get that. Like I will own up to that. But I was really impressed with, obviously, the manly left side attack. He was staying on that left wing. That is fantasy gold this season with Tommy back and playing. The other thing he was, carries were strong, um, was breaking tackles, look, looks lean, looks good, looks strong, look look quick. I think he ticked all the boxes there. I don't see Jackson Paulo as having a mortgage on that wing position. Jason Saab's obviously missing for a little bit. I don't know who's going to step into Tommy Talao's shoes, and I don't know how much depth there is there. But hopefully if he's on the lowest side of injury, we see him back soon rather than later. A really good asset for Manly this year moving forward. Um all conspiracy theories aside, I thought the eye test looked pretty good today, actually a bit better than I expected. So fingers crossed, Tommy, not too serious there on the scans front. Any other things you want to say on behalf of the sponsor, Tommy, Brian? I feel like I've really stitched him up there today by pumping him up all off season. Um, everyone in the Invitational was um, rinsing me on the group chat as well, um, which was, you know, a little bit frustrating for me because I wanted to see it go a different way. But any other things you want to add about Tommy to there, Brian? No, mate, just uh, I think exactly what you said. I saw the multi you put on and, and the promise was if the, if the two try plus multi got up, it was all going on magic round. So I was riding it as hard as you were uh, yeah, to get on a big weekend the for the boys. Just that didn't happen. Be guarantee anyway. Not, Not to, to be. be. We'll, we'll, we'll get on it next time. We'll make it happen next time when Tommy comes back. Last game of the round, Brian, was the Dolphins v. the Dragons. No other concerns out of this apart from the HIAs that we've already talked about earlier. So we're going to go into the Patreon questions. Patreon.com forward slash NRL Physio. If you want the content, if you want the questions answered on the Magic Sponge podcast, use the internet and search NRL Physio Patreon. You can probably figure it out pretty easily, I'd assume, by now. First question is about Jason Tamalolo. So Jason Tamalolo has been reported as degeneration of his cartilage in his knee. Could this force him to retire medically and give up the remaining part of his contract? Have we seen instances like this before, Brian, with um, players getting medical retirement for chronic knee concerns? James, this is news... Wouldn't we have loved to have had this in the offseason? Before the season. Mm. Jason Taumalolo has degenerative cartilage issue in his knee that is affecting his ability to train and also will affect his ability to play big minutes consistently moving forward. And I think that is the key here is, and I really need to emphasise this point, is just the words degenerative cartilage in the knee if i get that on its own i'm not all that concerned to be honest because i can guarantee you if you scan all of the nrl players in the nrl scan their knees especially those players over the age of like 26 27 what do you reckon the percentage is james i'd say 75 percent would have degeneration what do you reckon you're going to see some form of changes you know yep. you you're talking skeletal maturity at you know 22 at worst for blokes brian so really you're on a you're on a slope there that you're going to see some degenerative change most likely these guys you know that that do big training that have big trauma that have you know especially knee scopes like that's your biggest precursor as well the amount of scopes these guys have 
there's going to be all you know it's really hard to know the exact number but it would be most likely would be up there i'd imagine yeah 100 percent. and so i think that's the thing is that just that terminology doesn't move me one way or another all that much it's definitely a consideration but it's not all that much but it's the fact that you then relate that to, as you said, the fact that he's had the meniscus issue last year. He had the clean up. What happens there, and this is a good one to explain to people, is a meniscus surgery where they trim away the meniscus. Your meniscus is your shock absorber in your knee. If you go in and trim away a torn part of that meniscus, of that shock absorber, it will obviously more often than not help with your pain because you're getting rid of that torn piece of meniscus. Unfortunately, when you're looking at mid to long term, you've taken away some shock absorption. So for a guy who needs a lot of shock absorption like Jason Talmalolo, it can have negative effects in the mid to long term. Now, in saying that, we are less than 12 months from his meniscus surgery. I wouldn't consider that mid to long term. So this is a situation that was a bit unexpected uh we certainly didn't see it coming from uh yeah from what our analysis of that issue last year we were asked about it a lot in the preseason. we said look a lot of these scopes they especially in the short term in one to two years post doesn't pose too many issues but obviously Taumalolo's degeneration is more advanced and as I said, it is at the point where it is affecting, and it's more that functional stuff that is more valuable to us, right? Because it's affecting his ability to train. They're having to change his training schedule around that. And they also think that it's going to affect his minutes as well. I And, and speaking about like the initial question, which I know we've ranted on now, I just wanted to set a platform could this force him to have to retire medically and give up his contract? Absolutely it could. We've had it happen before. Anthony Watmo is probably the most high-profile case. But conversely, we have case after case after case of degenerative cartilage in the knee where players are able to manage it well under an NRL system, getting the best treatment around the clock. James Sedesco, perfect example. So he's had two stem cell... Uh, procedures in the last five years for degenerative cartilage in his knee. Look at him, how he performed today. Fantastic. Now he's, you know, there's been questions on his form over the last 12 months, not to do with, you know, his ability to, you know, handle a workload by any means. Boyd Cordner was a great example. He was dealing with degeneration in his knee from early 20s and he played on throw, so he managed it well. I had a guy who worked at the Warriors uh, messaged me about Simon Mannering. He had degenerative cartilage in his knee and was managed both training and in games for the last four years of his career. But you wouldn't have known it. Like Mannering played massive minutes, you know, like pr pretty consistently for, over those final years. So I think that's the thing to put to people is, and I know this probably, yeah, probably doesn't provide, you know, a lot of value here to say, it once again is such a wide ranging situation here. Like he could continue to have issues. It just keeps swelling up and he, he, he may need to retire medically. Now I, I don't think, and I'll, I'll, I won't talk in absolutes because we never know with this kind of stuff. It is very, very hard to medically retire someone with a degenerative issue like this. The reason Anthony Watmo could be medically retired is because he had a single incident in training that caused a significant tear, an acute tear, on top of the uh, the degeneration that he already had. So the that's why stuff, he got, Yeah, the pre-existing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why he was medically retired. If it's just straight up like ongoing stuff that's built up over time, he won't be medically retired in the sense that the Cowboys get his contract money back. He may have to retire because he can't keep playing a bit like, you know, but like he, he might have to retire of his own accord, but not like medi medically retired, uh, you know, and, and given all the money back from the Cowboys sense. But you only have to look like today, you know, he played 52, or not today, yesterday, he played 52 minutes, massive up from 20 minutes last last week. But it's once again, it's the concerns on workload, even when he plays 52 minutes, 11 runs for 129 metres, still an okay return for if you were a, 
you know, a bench, you know, or a middling NRL player, but he's supposed to be a million dollar player, right? 11 runs for 129 meters in 52 minutes. I think he scored 44 in Supercoach. I know Supercoach isn't everything in terms of performance, but yeah, that that's not a Jason Tamalolo that we've come to know and love. So I think, yeah, you, you definitely temper your expectations moving forward. You sell if you're a classic super coach owner. You try and get whatever you can if he puts up a big score in draft one week and say, this is the new normal. Look at Jason Taumalolo. But I just think you have to change expectation for Taumalolo moving forward. Even if he comes back and he runs for like 200 metres three weeks in a row, I just have no confidence that he's going to be able to do that for 10 weeks. James, I've ranted, I've ranted, I've ranted. As a Tamalolo buyer, uh, hit me with your take on this. I- I'm sure you'd be pretty similar. Very similar. I sold him last week on the back of the low score and on the back of the report that came out that you sort of posted through um, your connections there. I- again, I think it's just one of those ones. It would have been really nice to know at the start of the year. The red flag on Reflection Brian, and I remember seeing this on the TV and it didn't make sense until now, but you know how the Cowboys notoriously run Castle Hill as part of their preseason training, and they just get flogged up that hill all through the hottest part of the year in towns. It will be like chewing air, it'd be that hot. But when I reflect back on watching that a couple of times with one of the promos or docos that they were doing, Tamalolo and also um, one of the other players there, I think it may have been McLean. They were on pushies doing that, whereas everyone else was running. So that probably gives you a pretty good indication from a low limb point of view, things aren't so good. So in future, this is one that I want people to remind us of if we slip to the cracks or we forget this sort of stuff. You see someone on a push bike in preseason, red flag. Red flag for any knee concern, ankle concern, hip concern, maybe possibly as well. That to me, on reflection, I was like, far out. What? I was just thinking, oh, that's stupid. These two guys are on push bike. It's because they're managing their loads because they're managing like what they're doing f- through, um, you know, the training that they needed to happen. So done by me would have been very good to pick up before the season. But I think with the information we've got, you've just got to cut, cut the cord now and move on to a different option at front row forward. If you don't have to remain your team, he's pretty similarly priced. That's probably going to be the sideways move for a much, much better ascending option who looks really good today in in May there. So that would be my take on things, Brian. But the push bikes, make sure you remind me next year, Brian, see someone on a push bike to no bingo from, from the Magic Sponge, that's for sure. Mate, I like that rule. Let's uh, put it in the Bible and, uh, yeah, we'll just notch this up to an unfortunate one where we didn't have all the information and like we don't with a lot of these injuries, unfortunately. But, uh, yeah, we'll we'll learn from it and we will enact the push bike rule moving forward and be That's better right. for it. We, we will be better. Second question is about Ryan Pappenhausen. Would you think about buying Ryan Pappenhausen in standard but would rather him be gulking, obviously. Do you have any ideas if he'll take that back? It's a hard one to answer, Brian. I don't know. Because me, yeah. Really well. well, that's that's exactly right. And I, 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 we've spoken about this a few times. He's fit to kick at this point. So this probably isn't even, well, I guess I'm probably the only person you're going to ask about this because it still is, you know, injury related and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's. It's something that really only the inner workings of the team know. It's hard to have insight on this because he he is fit. He is absolutely fit to kick at this point. So it's not a physical thing. It's like a team vibe. How's Meany hitting them? How's he feeling about it? How's Paps feeling about it? Do we need Paps to worry about the kicking at this point? So, yeah, I think you just have to – if I was approaching buying Paps, I would – be buying him on the assumption that he is not goal kicking because if Meany keeps hitting him well, there's just not probably a whole lot of reason for Paps to take it back. Let him focus on his game. Uh, so yeah, I wouldn't buy him with the with the assumption that oh, he's going to get the kicking in the next couple of weeks. No. No, but I tell you what, he wanted to win goal kicking, but he looks sensational on the apple in more, which is one of the most beautiful things that you can see in rugby league especially a fullback wearing purple for the Melbourne Storm. It's just a throwback to B Slater, and I was all about it watching it live. It was a sensational game of footy. In the same game, Brian, Sean Johnson was not goal-kicking. Any idea why that was? Mate, this is still a massive mystery. We talk about it all the time. It takes a lot for injury information to make its way across the Tasman uh, and get to us. So, I, I like... 
actually, I'll use this opportunity to give credit to whichever journal it was. I'm sure they all listen to our podcast. Whichever journal it was who was at the Roosters and Manly game, straight up for both Manly and Roosters press conference, he just whacked out injury questions. How's Luke Keery? Uh, how's Tommy Talau? And he said Tommy Talau first, the the highest profile player, James, I might add. Tommy Talau asked about Alokawatu, asked that. about Turbo. I love that. But just smashed it straight up. All like both. And I was I was sitting there because I have to trawl through these, you know, press conferences often. But I was like, this is brilliant. So massive props to him. But conversely, no one asked. Andrew Webster about SJ not goal kicking, which I know in the grand scheme of things, but SJ is a big player for them. I just thought someone would ask, but no one has asked. There's been no information. So yeah, we're not sure. I assume he's got some form of like quad groin niggle because he was still kicking pretty well, like, you know, in game general play. kicking. Yeah, yeah general yeah. play kicking was still kicking really well. So yeah, not sure what's going on there. I'm really sorry. That's all right, Brian. We'll reconvene about that one as soon as we hear something from over the Dutch. Last question is about Connolly Lemo Elu. Did we ever hear information about whether his knee injury was an MCL injury or a MPFL injury ligament wise? No, we haven't yet. I'm still trying to chase that up as much as I love the Dolphins. The Dolphins don't tend to like me all that much. So, yeah, tough to get information from them, unfortunately. But, uh, yeah, I'll continue chasing and I'll let, especially patrons, I'll let you know as soon as I know anything. Uh, but, yeah, unfortunately, we don't have any information there either. Uh, mate, let's move straight to Supercoach Corner. It's another depressing week for the boys like under look i don't know where we are par wise or, or whatever but yeah like well under a thousand again mate hit me with what your moves were what you did and how you're gonna yeah how are you gonna fix this schmozzle mate because i i need all the help i can get yeah so i'm not going to be the person that's going to help you out there brian because i've got enough fires to put out in my own team so what I did last week, I was reckless and I used my first boost that I could possibly use and use it straight away. I don't call that reckless, Two mate. Boosts. I call that good playing. Good, That's good super coaching. That's what we're here for. So what I did was traded out Inari Tuala, Eisen Hu from center wing and Jason Tamalolo straight away. The thought was, where do I go with Tamalolo? Because I already had Max King. I was like, do I go to May or do I go up and just you know roll with one of the big boys? My plan was to go up to Payne Haas, who's now looking a bit dicey. So I rolled those guys out into Payne Haas. And then the center wing, I brought in Tommy Talau, which is not looking great for me at the moment. And also Fatape from the Tigers. So hopefully he can get an extended run, maybe if you get me a few dollars there. I don't really know how that's going. So anyway, it doesn't look like a great utilization of three trades for me straight up. Um this week, what about, well, last week I also captain Kalen Ponger as well, so only 9.23 for me. So it was pretty, pretty skinny kind of week there. This week, I'm partly tempted to boost again. It doesn't make me feel good, but I kind of need to go Highland Lukey to probably Josh Curran or Finifiniaki is probably the other one who's a smoky, but Curran's probably got more security long term. There's sort of word that he might go to dual position in the front row as well. There's a few people kicking off on social media that he should be seeing that in, in an update there. So if you can get him that way, that would be ideal. The other one was go Max King to Terra May. I think that's a bit of a no-brainer. Max King I thought would be better. He's not putting up the points to Terra May is, and um, there's, a, there's a bit of dollars to be saved there. And then the other one was bringing in Lussick at Hooker. He's got a massive negative break even. Feels a bit like a trap. I don't feel great about it, but I really need to cash generate somehow. That feels like the best option that I've got there at the present. The only other options would be trading Ponga down and getting some cash. So doing Ponga to Pappenhausen, Ponga to Reese Walsh. Feels sideways to do that, but it could save bulk coin. So there's there's that sort of justification of like how much money do you need to upgrade elsewhere compared to how many is Callum Ponga going to give you over Reese Walsh or over Ryan Pappenhausen. Oh, I think I've got too many other um, concerns in my team to worry about trading Ponga out. I'm happy to sit with Ponga and Turbo for a little bit longer. So that's where I'm at as it stands, Brian. So not feeling great to start the season. It's a bit yuck. I'm burning trades real quick. And it's still not really looking like there's much light at the end of the tunnel there for me in the standard format. So that's where I am. How are you going this week? 
Mate, I am not much better. I mean, I, I can say I'm the better bloke this week because I scored 937, but I think a bit like last week, I think I'm just the slightly less shit bloke because we're both not going well, unfortunately. Uh, I boost as well. I'm going to boost again this week. Like when your team's doing shit, I'm fine to just boost. Why not? Like try and save some trades down the line. You can get your team back on track. And I know people say, oh, you know, it's a long season and – but you can, unless you're in the shot, like we always talk about, you either win or you don't. You're either first or last. Just go for it. If you're doing crap, just go for it. You, I'm trying to come first, not 1,500th or whatever. So I'm probably not going to from 80,000th, which is where I'm ranked at the moment. But anyway, uh, so this week I boosted for Lomax, Terrell May, and Galvin. I captain Turbo. So yeah, yeah, look, you know, guns are just not going well. I don't remember another year where there's been so many uh i think this week levi out uh, well levi out for last probably the luxury one but i just feel like uh last got 76 minutes or something like that so i know everyone went off at brad arthur for the whole 80 minute hooker role in the preseason then he doesn't do it i feel like playing last for 76 minutes surely he only and and because they really got stitched up when they lost an outside back and they had to put a forward out there, I just, reading the tea leaves, I'm like, surely it's Lusick is the sole hooker and they have like a utility on the bench this week or something because they, like, yeah, a bit of recency bias, but they just got totally stitched up by having to put a forward out there who could not handle it all that well. Yeah, uh, that time I had an absolute day out, didn't oh, I? It was man. pretty... Pretty embarrassing for the Eels, sadly. Crazy, crazy. But then I've got two more trades. So of the four fallen guns, you, so you've got Cleary, Hines, Ponga, Turbo. I do probably want to trade one. I'm not sure which, but I'm leaning Ponga probably of the four. Uh, but I don't really know who to go to there. Like, yeah, that, that's a really, really tough one. I could also go, if I don't do that, I could go Lukey out to Curran. Um, as my th- sorry, Lukey out to Curran, but I my balls to the wall one is do I go Max King up to Tino? So with Haas's knee being a little bit dicey, does that limit his effectiveness? Does it limit his minutes? If so, Tino becomes like that creme de la creme front rower that everyone will want. Do I just try and get him in? I'd have to trade Ponger out to do that and then miss out on Curran or miss out on Lusick. So yeah, I've kind of got four trades there to go into three somehow, so I'm not really sure, but they're kind of the ones. I just don't feel fantastic about any options from Ponga. Like, you got Reese Walsh, but he's playing Penrith. You know, potentially Haas won't beat his best. Potentially Reynolds won't be there. Then you've got Paps. He doesn't have the goal kicking. Storm have got the bye in round four. Oh, round four. Yep. Eh, there's just not a you know not a massive standout option. Somebody said today go Cleary to Luke Brooks. Probably not the worst idea, which you know would have been crazy in the preseason. But yeah, mate, I'm still just thankfully my draft teams are going well because yeah, I'm I, like I'm back being a professional drafter because classic is just not. Yeah, it can get in the bin this year, unfortunately. That's all right, Brian. We'll, we'll chase up ground and, and make it back and we'll bring in a Dolphins premiership or a Broncos premiership and take out the cash in Supercoach, I reckon. We'll just keep burning our burning our boosts, mate. We'll just use them six weeks back to back to back and we'll be and we'll be ranked in the top yeah. ten for sure. Thing is, when you look at Brian, there's 43 trades left. It's a lot of trades. I'm like, can't take them with you. That's the thing. You got to try and get the team back on track. You got to start just churning through them and hope that you can cash generate, point of difference generate, get lucky. And you only need thirteen you know, for the like, buys, so you know, yeah, yeah, I'm going to have that it's easy. Like, that, that makes it easier. Yeah. <laughs> keep easy. Uh, keep convincing ourselves anyway. All right, mate. Yep. Uh, that's a wrap. As always, guys, if you like the pod, subscribe, give us a review, recommend to a friend. Sorry that I'll, we won't be here next week. Hopefully there's not too many major injuries. I will. Uh, the one thing I will be doing is always updating the patrons. So if there's any major injury issues, I will be doing a Q&A with them for sure next week. So any questions that come up next week or in the week ahead or next weekend, the patrons will 
get my analysis on those things. So it might be an opportunity to jump on a Patreon and see what's going on over there. But otherwise, yeah, James, have a good week. I will uh, be struggling on holidays, you know, doing it tough, but haven't had a break in a while. I've been sick as a dog lately, stressing my mind out. So a break is well and truly overdue. Mate, you have a good week at work. I'm glad I can say that to you because you said it enough to me when you're on your paternity leave. But, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to Bronx Fins in a couple of weeks, mate. That is on my calendar well and truly. Yeah, week after Easter, I think, isn't it? So that's going to be absolutely box office. Cannot wait. No, it'll be good. All right, guys, no outro track this week. Just uh, once again, you don't get to listen to syndesmosis or stem cell injury. So, yeah, see you guys again in two weeks' time.